I want to tell you about a quest that has led me for 22 years. Um, and it's still ongoing, so I'm still not there yet. Uh, I always loved poetry. I always love the way it moves me. If you think about it, uh, a poem you like is always, always seems like the very best way of saying whatever it is that it says. And as an engineer, that I now consider myself, I always thought that this was a, a good idea, that if we could somehow harness this power to optimize communication, this would be a very useful thing. So I was faced with this problem. What goes on in a poet's mind when he's trying to put words into paper? And if I had been trained differently, I would have probably done it, gone about it in a different way. But uh, as a physicist, I was very much influenced by Richard Feynman and this statement he had in his last blackboard, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So I set out to write a program that could write poetry. Now, computers have made great leaps forward in the last few years. You can type a question in Google and up come 20 million answers. Your laptop probably holds more information than my grandfather's library ever had. People talk to their cars and the cars answer back and sometimes they understand each other. <laughs> so if, if all this is going on, machine poetry couldn't really not be that far off. Well, poetry is a little more complex than that. If you think about it, these things that Google does, that the navigation systems in your car do, they are sort of the wheels of language. You can see them turning and they get you somewhere. But poetry is much more, at least like a bicycle, there's lots of wheels there and they all have to work together in specific ways. And that's not so easy to do. Also, there's another thing here, which is brains are very different from machines. You see your machines doing these things, and you think, oh, they're intelligent. They're a bit like a brain, an electronic brain. Wrong, very wrong. We don't really know enough about brains yet, even though some people are really working hard on this and making lots of progress. We don't know enough to make machines that are like brains. We know, but the little we know shows that there's big differences there. Brains are very, very complex, and they work in parallel. They're doing all these things at the same time. Machines are not like that at all. Machines are linear. They work step by step. But they work very fast, and they can store massive amounts of information. And by combining these two things, they usually produce some very impressive results. So, I want to rephrase the problem. Can we, within the limitations of machines, come up with something that will reproduce partially the behavior of brains while they're writing poetry? So this is what I'm doing. Fortunately, what happens when you read a poem is not actually in the poem. The poem is just like a music score. When you read the poem, it's your brain that provides all the instruments. And even though you get this experience of perception and emotion and memory and all these things, your brain is doing it based on what you read in the poem. So we can concentrate on the poem. Even so, it's very difficult. I tried, I've been doing this for going on to 20 years, I've tried a lot of different techniques from artificial intelligence, natural language processing, general problem solving. I started with grammar. I thought, there must be grammar in a poem. This is something that machines do well. They're good at grammar. So you b get them to build poems based on grammar. It doesn't work. Your real poets are not always grammatical. You, get, you write a poem based on grammar, 
it comes out stilted. Doesn't sound good. Try something else. Try logic. Machines are good at logic. But if you build your poems based on logic, they, they're boring. People don't like them. So at this point, I was a bit lost. What could we use? And then I had an idea. Machines are very good at memory. They're better at memory than at grammar. They're better at memory than at logic. You can actually say that they're better at memory than us. So that, this might help. I would need a solution based on memory. What, what would, should a machine remember if we're going to make this a solution based on memory? Well, poems. Every instance of a poem that has worked in the past is a successful example of how words trigger these specific emotions in the brain. So maybe if I could mine this in some way and use it to produce new poems, I could get something good. I would need to put in some, a little logic and a little grammar to make sure we, we avoid unreadable poems, but only a tiny bit, just enough, so, so we don't uh, spoil the magic. But there's this other question here, which changes how we think about the problem. Think about this. If you had your very own tame poet at home, and you wanted to order a poem, what would you say? What would you ask for? A sad poem? A poem about summer? A poem about me? A poem in the style of Chaucer? Now, this is important because, depending on the way you phrase that, it's actually a different problem. And the success criteria are different. So if you just ask for a sad poem, the system would really need to be able to predict how you're going to feel when you read the poem. And this is very, very difficult. And we don't know enough about how it's done yet, so I'll, I'll wait on that one. If you want a poem about summer or about yourself, then the machine would need to know about what happens in summer and how summer works or how you, what you like. And machines are known to be uh, very difficult at this. They, they're not very good at, at learning knowledge. There's a lot of people trying to research on that, but I, as I would have to solve that before I went on to do poetry, I decided to save that for later as well. But the style of someone is easier. I could have the, the, the machine remembered enough uh, poems by someone. I might be able to get it to write poems in the style of someone. So this is what I've done. I'm going to tell you about Wasp. Wasp is the wishful automatic Spanish poet. It's a poem I've been writing on and off for a, lo a long number of years. And it's called that because it's writes poems in Spanish, and it's not yet as good as I would wish it to be. I, I based this on two assumptions. One is that poets actually, at some stages during the composition process, they keep more than one possibility in mind, maybe to end a line, maybe to end a poem. And to, until they work out which one is best, they sort of keep them both there. I thought, oh, the machine is very good at this probably do it even better, because it doesn't have restrictions on short-term memory. So I'm going to have this work on a big set of drafts, all at the same time. I can't let them grow forever, so every now and then I get, I get rid of the bad ones, which is also important. And the other assumption is that the brains are not linear. The brains work in parallel. And I needed to find something to put in here that simulated that. So what I've done is, uh, rather than have one program doing the thing, I have a set of programs doing this. And each one of them is doing a different thing, and all doing it at the same time. And what happens now is I have three different kinds of program. I have some that generate sequences of words, and I call these babblers. And there's others that can just, they just they can tell how, whether the sequences are good or not, and these are judges. And the others that know how to change sequences to make them better. 
and these are called revisers. And these three kinds of uh, modules are all in there, and they're all working at the same time in this population of drafts. And every, every, every time they look for all of them and apply themselves to the ones they can think they can do something to. And every time this, the drafts get slowly better, and every, t every time the bad ones get culled. So if you do it long enough, and the machines are also very good at this, then you end up with some very good stuff. Now, how good? Well, I have an example here. It is in Spanish, of course. And you can see, this is in the style of Federico García Lorca. This was uh, trained in a big set of poems from the Romancero Gitano. And you can see, it's not, it, it, it's not that bad. You can read through it, and it almost makes sense. And it's almost poetic. It's definitely García Lorca. You can look up all these words, and they're all in, the, in his poems. And uh, all the metaphors are actually his. So it's not very original. But at least we've got something that looks like a poem. And the people not, not, do not frown upon, at least at the beginning. It, we haven't solved the problem. There's a lot of things I've let, left on the way. But I'm quite happy. I think this I could start playing with and slowly get somewhere. And I'm also very proud. In a certain way, uh, Wasp has become a better poet than me. Or at least it's become a published poet. Because a few years ago, uh, Dionisio Cañas was a respected Spanish poet. And Carlos González Tardón, who's a researcher in psychology, wrote this book, uh, Can a Computer Write a Love Poem? And they very kindly decided to include a selection of poems written by Wasp. Over the years, I've had, while I was doing this, I've talked to a lot of people and I've heard what they have to say about this. And there's two questions that kept coming back and that worry me. One is this one. Uh, why? What use could this possibly be? Uh, and well, to me, it was obvious at the beginning. I mean, poetry is there. Poetry is important. We don't know enough about it. And I want to find out. But people wouldn't, wouldn't be convinced. So, but I, I think at this stage, I have found a lot of things about poetry that I didn't know. Uh, for instance, that there's a lot more than grammar and logic to it, even though we don't know what it is. So I think it, it's worth to go on looking. The other question that keeps coming up is, do you think that you will get poems that someone will actually like? And there's nothing in a computer-generated poem that should make people dislike it. And yet people do. If you tell them it's computer-generated, people don't like it. In fact, I've had direct militant opposition. <laughs> I remember uh, I was giving a talk once uh, at a conference, and suddenly this young lady at the back got up and started shouting. She was saying what I was doing was very, very wrong. She was saying uh, poetry is for people, and computers should not be allowed anywhere near. Okay, we survived that one, but uh, it is true. People tend to dislike computer-generated poetry. I think it may be the case that uh, for the brain to trigger all this magic when reading a poem, it somehow needs to know that there's a person at the other end, that there's someone worthy of empathy. Or at least be able to believe to the illusion that there is. And you think about it, uh, when people read Shakespeare's verse, they don't care that Juliet is not real. They still think she's worthy of empathy. The, the poet has achieved this, to get people to feel empathy for a character that doesn't exist. 
Now, that is the sort of uh, performance that I think we might achieve at some stage. It's very far off. This is, I haven't finished with this at all. Uh, but I think we've made progress. We now have this, I like this idea of the map of, of uncharted territory. We now know a little better what, how much uncharted territory is out there, and we know that there is, and this wasn't that evident before. And we already have the pieces in place to start exploring that, and we, started, we have started filling in the map. And the interesting thing is that all the mechanisms that are involved here are also involved in most uses of language that you can think of. So I do think it is important to work out what they are. And I also think that it would be much easier to discover them by studying poetry than by concentrating only on the easy things that work, like search queries or navigation directions. So I will go on with my quest, even if it takes me very long. Thank you very much.